A very good afternoon to everyone. I'm Nicholas Teo, employability trainer from E2I. Uh, thank you to Northeast CDC for organizing this event. And thank you as well to everyone who has followed us uh, the past three weeks. Um, so we have now come to the fourth and final Career GPS virtual workshop. And the topic today is how to transit into my target job. So I understand from the uh, from some of the questions that are coming in uh, for past recordings, um, uh, fret not, you will be able to find uh, these recordings after the whole uh, after after today, likely sometime uh, next week uh, at the place where you registered yourselves. Okay, so going going back down to the topic for today, so navigating through a career transition uh, can be extremely challenging and exhausting. Yeah, today we have specially invited Tiban Raja. Associate Career Coach with E2I, Facilitator and Change Management Consultant from Elvigor, to give his perspective on the topic. Hi, Steven. Great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicholas. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here today. My name is Steven, and I'm an employability trainer and career coach with E2I. And I've supported over 2,000 professional managers, executives uh, through their career transition. Really excited to be here today with you to share some interesting insights. And thank you so much, Nicholas, for having me. Thanks, Stephen. So let's jump straight into the topic today, shall we? Uh, could you help us unpack the topic, how to transit into my target job? Sure. So how to transit into my target job is quite a interesting and a huge topic, right? Because if you really think about it, there are two key elements here. Number one, how do you make the transition? What is the strategy? What is the process? And number two, your target job. Mm, have you decided what your target job is? Do you know where or how do you go about finding or getting into your target job? So today we do have quite a number of people. We have over 100 of us here today. So I do want to hear from y'all. So we're going to be launching a very quick uh, Zoom poll. Yeah, there's going to be two questions for you. So uh, maybe Kara, could you help me launch the poll? Question number one, help me understand when are you looking to make your transition into your next job? Are you looking to get into your next role within the next zero to three months, three to six months or above six months? <laughs> if your answer is like, even mine option D, what? <laughs> yesterday, <laughs> I'm looking to transition yesterday. <laughs> then you go with the zero to three months. Yeah. Now, the second question in the poll is, have you decided what your next target job is? That means you know what is the job title, uh, you know what kind of industry it is, and you're very clear. Or are you still like, uh, no, I'm, I'm not too sure. I'm just, you know, trying to figure out all these things. Or are you in option number three, which is you're still exploring. That means you have a few options. Uh, maybe I want to go into healthcare. Uh, maybe I'm considering uh, Infocom technology. So do share with us where you are. Yeah, so we're getting in the responses. We're about 65%. Once we hit about 80%, we will end the poll, yeah? Very, very interesting numbers that we see here. Okay. <laughs> So, okay, that's nice. Okay, so we have almost hit uh, 80%. So, Kara, could you maybe help me to share the results, please? Nicholas, are you able to see the, the poll results? Yes, yes, I'm able to see. So, so Stephen, uh, what do you think about the results that we have on screen, to, uh, on screen now? We have a very diverse group. So we can see that majority, or more than 56% of us, we are at the zero to three months, right? When you want to get into your next role. Uh, then the rather, I would say 25%, a quarter of us are looking at three to six months. And uh, some of us are looking at more than six months. And if you look at, have you decided on what your next target job is? There's almost an even split. 50% uh, saying that, yes, they know exactly where they want to go to. Uh, and then 50%, hey, you know, I'm still exploring. I'm trying to gather as much information as I potentially can. So we do have quite a diverse group here today with us, Nicholas. Yes. So, uh, yeah. So what comes to mind, uh, Tiban, when you think about transiting into uh, a target job? Okay, so if based on the demographics that we have here today, right, I, I think it's quite clear that uh, there's half of us who are, who are very certain where you're going to next, and there's half of us who are still exploring. Now, the, the strategy that will happen will be slightly different for these two groups. When I say strategy, I mean the sequence of job search activities and the processes will be slightly different here, Nicholas. Um, so I hear that. I, I picked up two words, right, that you mentioned earlier. Process and sequence are important considerations. Yeah. Could you share with us more? Okay. So regardless of which of these groups you are in, right, either you're in group A or group B, 
all of us in today's session, we can only move in four potential directions when it comes to a career transition. So allow me to, to share this with you. Yeah, The first direction that any one of us can potentially move into is you can go back into doing the same role in the same industry. The second direction that you can go into is going into the same role, but different industry. And the third direction that you can move into is to doing a different role, but you stay within your same industry. And the last one, and I call this the career pivot because you're moving into a different role in a different industry. Uh, this is uh, interesting. Uh, so share with us, uh, can a job seeker uh, transit into a S4 situation? Okay, so this, this is a very interesting and a very common question that I get. Now, before I share with you, I would like to hear from our audience, right? So I've got a question for you. My question for you is, imagine that you are an employer, okay? So you are an employer and you are receiving applications. Who would you shortlist? Would you shortlist candidates from S1, S2, S3 or S4? So if you are an employer, where will you shortlist candidates? So go into the group chat and type for me, right? S1, S2, S3, or S4. So we see some responses. Thank you so much, Wing Kiet. Thank you so much, Nick, Violet. So I see S1, S1, I see S2 as well, okay? S1, S2. So Carol says S1 and S2. Uh, Yongchin says S1, S2. Uh, Greg says, depending on the job description, S1, S2. Uh, Pauline, okay. So I think, uh, and thank you everyone uh, for sharing. Yeah, round of applause for all of you. So I think Nick, it's very clear, right? That I think many of us, uh, we are saying that employers will pick up from S1 because think about it and, and, and imagine, right? If you are the HR in that particular organization and you're receiving all these job applications, resumes, and now you need to shortlist to give to your hiring manager. If you were to shortlist candidates from S3 and S4, your hiring manager might look at you and say, hey, you're not doing your job. Why well, you shortlist for me candidates who have no relevant experience in the role or industry? So most likely they will shortlist from S1 or S2 because this is the lowest risk candidate. So I hope that answers the question, Nick. Yeah, so this would then pose a great challenge for individuals wanting to change industry, right? Does it mean then that we will forever be stuck in an S1, S2 and, never, and can never really move into an S3 and S4 situation? Absolutely not because I have helped hundreds of people make this transition from S1 to S4. Now, at this same time, um, the timeline is a little bit more different, Nick. You mentioned timeline, uh, share with us a little bit more. Okay, so let me share with you one of my, my candidates, right? Her actual transition and her story. So she's in her mid forties. Uh, she works in the shipping industry, right? As a shipping agent, very administrative related work. Uh, for those of us here today who have been in the shipping industry, you do know how stressful it is, right? When you have to make sure you get all of the paperwork done on the deadline so that you don't get any fine by the port authorities. So when she came into our, our career resilience executive workshop by E2I, uh, we did a lot of, I would say, personality profiling. We did a lot of digging into her interests and we discovered something. So she said, Tiban, you know, Monday to Friday, right? When I go to work, at the end of the day, I feel like I completely no energy. Even sometimes Saturday, must go and finish work, <laughs> really no energy. But the one day in the week where I replenish all my energy, right, is on Sunday. So I said, what happens on Sunday? She said, Sunday is church day, where she goes for church activities, you know, they have youth camps, so she's a mentor or a coach. Then I was like, hmm, that's interesting. So I asked her, hey, what if you could do a role very similar to what you're doing on Sunday and you get paid for it? She said, can I? I said, absolutely. So I shared with her that she can consider becoming a youth worker within the social services industry. Now, I want to ask all of us an honest question, right? Right now, if she was in S1 as a shipping agent in the shipping industry, and she started applying for roles as a youth worker, do you think she stands a good chance of getting an interview? Or is it low? Do you think high chance or low chance? Go to the group chat and help me type in. Who says, yeah, she very high chance. Sure can get one interview. Or who says, oh, I think the chances are a bit low, Tiban, because completely different role, completely. Yeah, absolutely, right? So she, she, so this is where we have to strike a balance, right? Because yes, I want to go into S4, but even at the same time, every month, 
I have bills to pay. I have to put food on the table. So what then? So this is where she kind of discovered that maybe she needs a stepping stone to go. She needs a stepping stone. So what do I mean by stepping stone? She first needs to put her foot into the industry. So she started scoping down administrative related roles, but only within the social services. And she actually managed to secure a six month contract uh, as an admin person in NCSS. Now, we all know contract, right? It's, it's no certainty. Eh? <laughs> so the time that you have there, you have to really cherish it. And she told herself, La, yes, she has to go to work, you know, eight to five to do this, but she has got another job to do. Eh? And her job was to talk to as many people within that industry to get as much advice. Like, where did you go get certification? What kind of certifications to do? Building very strong relationships, quancy, right? <laughs> In the Western world, they call it networking. La, but here we know that means quancy. So she built a lot of relationships, not only with the internal stakeholders, but also external stakeholders. So what kind of external stakeholders? Typically, people who approach NCSS could be from NGOs, non-profits, where they're going for grant applications, and she's assisting them with all of these things. So she built very strong relationships with people inside and also from outside the organization. Now, towards the end of her contract, she reached out to these external stakeholders, you know, all these NGO bosses and all, right? And she said, hey, you know, thank you so much. It was a pleasure working with you over these six months, but I'm actually making a, a transition to becoming a youth worker. Can you give me some advice? Ah, can you give me some advice? Not, can you please give me a job? Because you know as well as I do <laughs> that people love to give advice. <laughs> actually, people like to give unsolicited advice. So when you go and ask them, hey, can you give me some advice for them? It's like, oh, <laughs> yes, please sit down. I've got so much advice to give you. And through this, what she was able to do was she was able to land a job as a youth worker in one of these smaller NGOs. Now, guys, let's pause for a second here. And if you look at this transition, you will realize something. She never actually goes into S4. Do you realize? Because from S1, the moment she puts her foot into that industry, social services, it is no longer a different industry for her. So the transition she had to make just became one step easier. So I hope this kind of uh, gives us a better idea, yeah, Nicholas, on how can we make this transition from S1 to S4. Thanks, Stephen, for this uh, for this story. I think it was very uh, it was very clear um, and and very interesting to see uh, uh, someone's journey like this. Yeah, uh, it also seems that being clear and determined, right, to get to your target job, uh, is important in successfully transitioning into that job. Uh, but I think today we might also have in our audience individuals uh, who might not have decided what their what their target job is. Uh, how about them? Mm, okay, this is very relevant, right? Um, sometimes we want to make a change for whatever reason, but we are not very certain where can we move to next. And, you know, through our E2I workshops and career coaching, this is where we actually dive in very deeply to help you understand not only where your career values and what your desires are, like, what we want to go to, but it also has to match with the skills and competencies. So maybe can we do a very quick exercise since we are already here today, right? I'm going to ask you a question and I want you to share your thoughts with me in the Zoom group chat. My question to you is, is there a difference between a job versus the job? So is there a difference between a job versus the job? We're starting to see responses coming in. Fantastic. Yeah. So I see, uh, Tzu Sui says, big difference. <laughs> okay, so could you tell me, right, what is the difference? What is the difference? How would you define your er job and how would you define your the job? So let's take about 30 seconds here, guys, and share. And however you want to define it, right, because it's your career. So I see uh, Yutio says, uh, one puts food on the table, Another is aligned to your values, interests, personality, and skill sets. Very nice. <laughs> you too, that's very nice. <laughs> uh, Grace says passion, having the passion, right? 
Uh, I see Celestine says uh, one is any job versus the job that you want. Uh, Siang Ring says Pacific. Uh, Ag says passion. Uh, Ping uh, Pingli says very nicely. She said a job equal money, <laughs> money sign. Uh, the job equals to passion. Thank you, thank you so much, everyone, for sharing. And and you're right, because a job is something that you have to do to put food on the table, just purely for money. But the job is something that you enjoy, something that you relish doing, right? A job may be something you wake up on Monday, you hit the snooze button four times, you like keep, you, <laughs> you know. I always realize, ah, uh, people say they're not good at maths, but actually, right, uh, all of us become genius mathematicians in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> when we wake up, then we start calculating. Okay, from here to the bathroom, two minutes. If I shower, okay. If I don't shampoo, maybe I save three minutes. Then I walk to the bus stop. <laughs> then they will calculate how much more time they can snooze and sleep. <laughs> and if they're doing that regularly every day, maybe it's an indication that you're feeling a little bit burnout, or maybe you're feeling that that is an ur job for you. But the job is something that you enjoy doing. Now, the the job could be very different for different of us, because. For some of us, maybe the job is something where you get good remuneration, you get a lot of recognition, you get growth opportunities. But for another person, the job could be something where they have work-life balance, where they're able to make decisions, where they're able to lead and supervise a team of people. And typically, what I've noticed when I'm career coaching, younger people they focus more on the growth and development. But for more of us mid-career professionals, we value work-life balance, remuneration, right? So there is going to be a difference between what your ur job means and what your ur job means. Sorry, I saw. I can hear. You. Is it? I think is it Elvin or Sidek? Okay. So this is, I would say, a, a big difference between ur job versus the job. Now, at the same time, right, ladies and gentlemen, could I invite you, right, to share my thoughts? Sometimes, sometimes, is it possible? That for us to get to our the job, we may need to take on a few the jobs. Share with me in the group chat. Is it possible that sometimes to get towards your the job, you need to take on a few the jobs? It is possible, right? And this is what I mean. Like when my candidate went from shipping agent to becoming a youth worker, she knew where her the job was, but she had to take on two. A jobs to get towards that the job. So I hope that kind of gives you some uh, idea. Yes. Yeah? Thanks, Stephen. And and this ties in uh, very nicely with my next question, right? How would you measure success uh, here uh, in uh, a career transition? Okay. How would I measure success? So I think we redefine the question. And my question to everyone is: You determine how you want to define what success means for you in your career. Because firstly, how each of us define the job is very different. So some value growth, some value, as I said, work-life balance. And if they are able to achieve these things in their career, I think they are one step closer. Right? That is a form of success. And for some of us, you know, if there are other things that are more important, and you are achieving this in your career, then I would still say that you are getting career success. So your definition of Of um, how successful you are in your transition largely depends on your clarity of what is it that you really want. Thanks, Stephen. And I think this is an important consideration for all of us here today, right? A successful transition really is about a process of moving into a role which itself uh, could fulfill what we want in our career or life stage at a later at a late, some later time. Yeah. Um, okay. So, what about for individuals whose the job is in the S four category, uh, different role, different industry? How long could a transition typically take? Okay. So this is a this is a very common question that I get, right? And based mm -hmm. on having helped over thousands making this transition, I discovered that it takes anywhere between six months to two and a half years for this transition, and it largely depends on where are you looking to transition, right? Is it an entry level position, a mid level position, or a senior level position? So the higher the level, the longer runway you need to build for yourself. Okay, so earlier when we did the poll, uh, Tiban, uh, we realized that there are some in the audience uh, looking at zero to three months to find an ideal job, uh, three to six months to find an ideal job, and some even looking at more than six months. Yeah. So what should I do uh, if my ideal uh, timeline, right, to to find a, the job is uh, zero to three months, uh, but my target job is in the S four category? 
<laughs> Thank you for this question. <laughs> it is a it is a tough question to answer, but I'm going to be. Can I be honest with y'all? I'll be very honest with y'all. Okay. Earlier, when we looked at the polling, right, there are some of us who said zero to three months is when we are looking to get our next role. Now, if you're looking to get a next role within the next zero to three months, and your target job is within S four. Do you realize how much pressure and stress you are putting on yourself? Because you set yourself up such a short time, you know, to achieve something that typically takes longer. And I know today is a career-related program, and we're talking about careers, lah. But you know, we are not robots. There's not only one part of our life, right? Career is only one part, but there are other things that are happening in our life, right? Family, finances, commitments, and so on. And We are not able to like just compartmentalize and and separate ourselves from here. So I would say that you, the first thing we must acknowledge, all of us, right? Some of you may already be in transition because you know due to retrenchments or maybe you have already left. Some of you maybe your company you are seeing that there's an impending retrenchment coming and you're trying to plan things for yourself. Wherever you are, I would like to assure you that you are doing the best that you possibly can. At this given moment, remember this, guys, that you are trying to do your best, and you are doing your best. So you have to be kind to yourself that you are doing your best. Sometimes we forget this. Sometimes we put a lot of expectations on ourselves, and usually the people we beat up the worst, right, is ourselves. So I would like y'all, number one, right, be kind to yourself. It is but a strategy to get you where you want to go to. I know what all our outcome is. Each one of us here, our outcome is to transition into the job that we enjoy doing. But at the same time, is this outcome something you can control? Is it really within your decision or your power to make it happen? It could be something that you can't control, right? Because whether you get into a placement largely depends on the employer, whether they decide to give you the offer later. So do not. Put too much focus, right, into the outcome because that is what when we don't get to, you know, when we're sending out seventy, eighty resumes, no interview. You go for interview after interview, but there's no placement. And when we put too much focus into the outcome, it is unconsciously just digging away at us. Instead, I invite you to take a look at what you can control, and what you can control is the process. So, what are some things that we can control? Number one. The number of resumes that you choose to send out every day, whether you're going to send one per day or five per day, that is something you can control. How much time you decide to sit down in front of a mirror, you know, and practice interview questions. Let's say you have hundred interview questions every day. You just choose three to answer. Within a month, you would have already practiced ninety. That you can control. Whether you are being passive and only applying through Job Street and LinkedIn. Or are you deciding to become active, creating a profile on LinkedIn, attending workshops, networking, going for industry events? That is something that you can control. So I would like us to have a shift in the the mindset, right, from just focusing on the outcome to think a little bit about the process, because the process is something you can control, and the outcome will definitely follow. Um, yes, Ivan. I think this is another important reminder for all of us today. Yeah, to focus on the things that we can control uh, rather than be consumed by things we cannot. Um, really, also because uh, we want to protect ourselves from this thing called job search fatigue, right? Yeah, and and who knows? Uh, if we keep seeking to improve ourselves, we might eventually chance upon an opportunity aligning our past experiences with new experiences we acquired while in transition. Right. Yeah. Another thing uh, I think you are alluding to is about celebrating small wins. So, as a father of a toddler, my wife and I were always looking out for key milestones. Um, as my kid was growing up, right, and it made me realize that we have forgotten how to celebrate uh, small wins. Yeah. Uh, and I also realized in my work with uh, career transitioners that this is also important uh, to keep us staying positive, right, in the midst of multiple uh, rejections. Yeah. Um, great. So, so in your experience, uh, given what are some pitfalls uh, uh, that we should take note of? Okay, so before we come to the pitfalls, right? I think you are absolutely right when you talk about the small celebrations because we, as I said, and I always tell this, and I honestly believe I don't know whether y'all have the same feeling. I feel right that 
the job search process is the most brutal competition in the world because even in the olympics got three winners correct or not got gold medal silver medal bronze medal but in the job search competition got how many only one right whether you get placed or you don't get placed and usually because we are the hardest on ourselves you could have been the second most viable candidate no but what do we tell ourselves oh, i think of the worst i really cannot make it right and we we tend to put all this pressure so it is very important that you do surround yourself with people who encourage you who give you hope who point you who may not be able to give you advice or help you but who are there to you give you emotional support because i think knowledge in today's world is very easy to acquire right you can go to youtube you can go sign up for the e2i coaches session in co- you like today's session that you're here today it shows that you are taking action so these are the things that we can and you know let's say you you are you have been searching for usually the job search fatigue starts to set around the 6 month mark and if you're already at the 4 5 months and you're feeling that pressure building up please remember to celebrate the small wins So if you had set yourself a goal okay today I'm going to send five resumes out and if let's say you do send five resumes out reward yourself maybe tonight right you watch one extra episode of hometown cha 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 has to be as simple as that because you are you are appreciating and acknowledging yourself now as you're going through this process I want to just share with you three common pitfalls that I've often seen right when people are going through this process so let me share uh, my slides here So I would say the first one is not having a clear strategy. That means you may find yourself okay I want to maybe go into healthcare why? Because every day I open newspaper they say healthcare emerging. I talk to my friends they say hey they got 10,000 jobs. Need to go need to go need to go. Then they say okay I want to apply and then you start applying. But then you have no response. Then you're wondering what is wrong with you? What is wrong with your resume? No nothing is wrong with you. It is all a strategy. Maybe there are certain skill gaps but gaps are meant to be closed so i would say not having a clear strategy is a very common pitfall now the next one that i've noticed is not doing your homework <laughs> i'm very guilty of saying this lah because as a student right i was always the boy eh, who was outstanding you know why because i was always outside the class standing because <laughs> never do homework right but i think we have no choice but to swallow this bitter pill that you have to do your research and your homework If you want to move into a new industry, right? Go to LinkedIn. You can connect with people who are already in the industry. Probably in your personal circle there are people who can give you some advice. You can go meet career coaches. Beyond that, right? You can look out for those events that are being held. Like last week I went to attend this uh, virtual career fair by one of the banks in Singapore and I learned so much about retail banking within that 2 hours. So if you are interested in moving into somewhere go do your homework start doing your research now the third common pitfall that i have is that we do not give ourselves enough time we <laughs> and i don't know whether it is part of our singaporean dna but we are quite impatient people right sometimes and we set ourselves okay you know i want to make a transition within 3 months and i want to go into s4 and you have all these timelines and when it doesn't happen it becomes very painful for us So talk to people who have walked that path that you are thinking of walking. They will share with you how long it makes to take the transition. And you know in today's world sometimes you don't even have to talk to people. You can so I was kind of like coaching one of my candidates who wanted to move into UI UX. Yeah, user interface, user experience and he was coming from a back end software. So what he did was he went to LinkedIn look for people who were uh, who have done UI UX scroll through their work history right and shortlisted the people who started as a software developer then he see typically how long it takes for them to make a transition then he calculated so he has a benchmark so this time thing i would say don't put this pressure on yourself unnecessarily talk to someone share your thoughts bounce some ideas and then you craft out a realistic timeline i think these are the three common pitfalls yeah nick Uh, that we do have to look out for. Thank you, thank you. Um, but, but what if I find myself right in a situation where I really do not have enough time, or I did not strategize or do enough research? Uh, yeah, what advice do you have for uh, for for yeah for me? I would say be kind. Remember, I say we are not robots. <laughs> we are not perfect. We are meant to be um, in, to be imperfect. But it doesn't mean that we are imperfect, right? 
So I think the first thing is you have to be kind. If let's say you set yourself three goals, you're only able to hit one. Hey, that is progress. Every day that you're taking one step forward towards the job that you desire, I call that a victory. And stick with the process. And you have to remember that you do not have to do this alone. Right? So get the people, you know, who, who will support you through this journey, Nick. Thanks, thanks, Stephen. And, um, and of course, I think uh, being from, from E2I, uh, we also like to encourage you uh, to seek moral support right, from, uh, from your career coaches to visit our website uh, and to book a one-to-one uh, career coaching as well. Yeah. Um, okay, great, Stephen. So any final word of advice uh, that you have for us today? Okay, so I, I, I didn't really have anything, but I saw Eileen ask the question, any advice for someone who is still unsure about their target job? So I think first thing is assure yourself that there are many people, they don't know where they want to go to next. So you're not, you know, it, it is not very unique or it's not something that's wrong with you. It is very normal. I would say as what uh, Nick mentioned, get uh, go to our E2R website, go and talk to a career coach, right? Because when you talk to people, right, the, the purpose of a coach is not to give you the answers because the answers already lie within you. But because there are many things running through your mind, and we call these the intersectionalities of issues and concerns, you may not be able to have the clarity to make a decision. But when you start talking to a coach, when you attend sessions like today, an idea may pop up in your mind, a reflective point may come up. And from there, you will get a lot clearer on what kind of target jobs you can go. So I hope this kind of, uh, this would be my last uh, word of advice, Nick. Thanks, thanks, Stephen. Um, thanks again for your sharing. Uh, and, and today, we have also specially invited one of your past participants who attended the Career Resilience Executive Workshop to share uh, with us about her job search journey. Yeah, uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Sumadi. Hi, Sumadi. Welcome to Career GPS. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me on the webinar. Yeah, uh, and thank you for availing your time today. We are most happy to have you. Uh, yeah, uh, could you please introduce uh, yourself and share with us a little bit about your job search journey? So I was working for a company for three years as a business operations manager and pursuing my degree before it was acquired by another company with the same job title. Two years later, in the company, in the new company, I was retrenched. Okay, um, and it sounded like it must have been quite a period of uncertainty for you, right? Um, and what, what motivated you to complete your degree while you were working? So what motivated me to complete my degree is actually uh, having a degree is my childhood dream. Uh, but because of my commitments with my life, with others, uh, other matters, uh, I couldn't complete earlier. So uh, I decided, and it's also because uh, the minimum qualification for the job I was looking for is a degree. So I really mm -hmm. was determined to complete my degree. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, just to just to get a, a little bit of the timeline, right? Uh, you were in a you, you were in the job for a while, and uh, before before retrenchment, and you decided at some point you wanted to go for a degree, right? So this was even before your retrenchment happened, before you even knew about your retrenchment, was that right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, great. So, uh, what happened then after your your retrenchment? So immediately after I was retrenched, uh, I started looking for jobs, sending 50 applications per week. I either get no response or unsuccessful yeah, yeah, application yeah. from employers. During my retrenchment process, I registered myself with E2I and a coach contacted me to see if I would, I would be keen to attend crew workshop conducted by Alvega. After attending the workshop, I realized that my resume is scrappy. I redo my resume sent to the people who can help me wet through the resume. I even reach out to Alvika to wet through my resume. I continue sending applications after applications, still no response or unsuccessful application from employers. I didn't only look for full-time position, I applied for part-time position too. My idea is to get a job. So in January this year, uh, I attended Win the Interview Workshop, which taught me how to answer the interview questions using the STAR method. Exactly eight months later, I got opportunity for one interview. To cut the story short, I went for five rounds of interview using STAR method to secure the current job I am now as an office manager. Thanks, uh, Sumati. Can you give us an idea uh, of what, what were the kind of uh, what was the number of rejections that you were getting uh, you know, 
during that, that period of transition? So you just imagine I, I submit 50 applications, I won't get any response or rejection is like maybe half of it was like just uh, unsuccessful. Okay, thank you. So what then do you think contributed to your success, uh, your successful transition? So the first thing is, I think, is the degree because it was the minimum qualification requirement for my current job plus my experiences. And then practicing my interview mm -hmm. questions with my daughter every day. And importantly, I believe that there was a job coming on its way to me. Okay. Uh, thanks, Sumadhi, for, for your sharing. So uh, for your audience, for, audience, for our audience today, um, who might be going through a tough transition period like you did, right? Uh, what is one thing that you would like to share uh, with them to take home? Okay, I have three things actually. So first, you must trust and believe that there's a job for you and that you're open to any opportunity which comes your way. Meanwhile, don't focus on what is going through now. Instead, focus on what else you can do to boost your self-esteem, confidence, motivate yourself by doing the things you like. Lastly, through my experience, I know that this is not an easy journey for sure, but it will definitely pass. Thanks, uh, Sumadhi. Um, thanks for your sharing uh, and thanks for encouragement. Yeah, uh, I think believing that there is a job out there uh, for you, especially during this period, is so, so important, right? Yeah. Uh, and and Tita, may I invite you back? Uh, do you have any additional thoughts that you'd like to add on uh, before uh, on, on what uh, Sumadhi shared uh, before we uh, move on to Q&A? Sure, I, I not not so much of thoughts, but a confession, lah. You know, <laughs> like you know when you when you hear Sumadhi's story, and I and my confession is, many people think as a trainer that I motivate people, but actually that's false. My motivation comes from people like Sumadhi, because you know when you have been in your career for that long, and when you get hit by something that was not of any of your fault, right? COVID is nobody's fault, lah. And not giving up and still keeping your, your, I would say, your foot on the pedal, like, you know, grabbing your daughter. I can, I can literally picture, you know, on the dining table, sit down, okay, <laughs> I'm on the practice. You sit down, you answer all my questions. <laughs> you tell me how I'm doing. And I think this is something that really is encouraging for us. And it always reaffirms that, hey, do not focus too much on the outcome. Focus on the process and you will get to your outcome. So that's just a confession I would have, Nicholas. <laughs> uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for... Uh, thanks both yeah, for your uh, sharing today. Uh, and right now, actually, we do have some time for questions. So uh, once again, if you have not already used our Mentimeter, uh, please do so. Uh, the Mentimeter uh, for the Q&A should be on the, uh, yeah, in, the, in the chat shortly. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay, maybe uh, let me just... Look at some of the questions that are coming in. Okay, so I, I have a question here from uh, from the audience, and this question will uh, will be for Tiban. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do you uh, transit from the private sector uh, to the public sector? So how do you make a transition from the private to the public, right? So I think this uh, it, it is not so much about uh, the sectors itself, whether it's public or private. But I would like to understand, okay, currently what is the role that you're doing? What are the set of skills and competencies you have? And what kind of a role are you looking to move into? Because certain roles in the public sector, let's say you want to be a teacher, right? There's a very clear pathway for you. Go to NIE first and so on. Let's say you want to become a nurse. Also, there are certain clear things. So I would say, uh, don't look at it as private or public sector or don't look at it as industries, but look at it more as making a shift from your this current role, understand what are the skills that you can bring into the next role. So okay. that's how I would I would look at it. Okay, great. And and maybe this question, uh, the next question, uh, will be uh, for for both uh, Sumati and for Tiban. Okay. Uh, so this is a comment by uh by one of our audience. So my contract ends uh next May, and my boss uh, tells me that I uh, cannot improve in my work. I will be asked to leave. Okay, my boss tells me if I cannot improve on my work, I'll be asked to leave. Uh, and I have been approached by a company to interview next Monday. I am in a dilemma. Uh, what should I do? 
Uh, so maybe I'll ask Sumadhi to answer the question first and then uh, Tibon can add on uh, shortly uh, after, after that. Sumadhi, any thoughts on this? Um, okay, so I think that uh, you just give a shot to go for the interview and then uh, see what comes to you. So you just move forward. Don't, don't think that uh, is the retrenchment going to happen or not going to happen, but there's an opportunity, right? Just move forward. And go for it. Thanks, Sumadi. Uh, Tibo? Um, first of all, you know, I, I, I'm i sorry to hear that because I can kind of sense your the pressure. Some more Christmas coming and then your boss give you this kind of news. Couldn't you wait till January, right? <laughs> now, I, I look at it this way. Whenever there's one door that closes, definitely there's another door that opens. Whether at the point of time you see it opening or not, but it definitely opens. Uh. Here, I would say... You know, you be more proactive. I mean, if you have gotten the interview, it means on paper, on your resume, you are a valuable person. So go in for that interview, talk to them, see where that will bring you. Now, if let's say that is not something you want to do because maybe you're not comfortable or whatever the reason, I would say that May, if you have a mindset that okay, May is your last day, you have a perfect timeline. You have five months to prepare your career assets, your strategy, and then to make a transition into something that you resonate with more. So either way, right, I see it's a win-win situation for you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for your sharing, Tibon. Uh, another question uh, here. Uh, how do I know if my target employer is willing to hire me, even though I may be interested to transit? Tibon? Very relevant question. So you always have to have this mindset, right? So if you look at like the greatest salespeople in the world, the mindset they have is, they will ask themselves, they will put your, themselves in the client's shoe and have this question, what's in it for me? So what's in it for you is you want to, let's say, okay, la, for me, one of my target employers would be Google only for one reason, because they have a very nice pantry and free lunch <laughs> and I love food, right? But that's what I want. But what about what Google wants? Why would they want to hire me? And if you can leave no doubt in their mind that, hey, you can bring the skills so there are only like a couple of things that employers are looking out for. Number one is your skill set. Number two is your attitude. And number three is your knowledge. So you have to do an assessment of yourself. Are you able to fulfill these three things for them? Because if you can, then it's not really a question of whether they want to hire you, but you leave them no choice. When you showcase that, hey, I'm like the Ferrari standard of candidates. So have no doubt in your mind, I am the right fit for you. And if currently there are gaps with your skills, with your knowledge, then that is also a starting point for you to close these gaps to get to where you want to go to. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a final question for uh, both uh, Tiban and Sumadi. Yeah. Um, what is your advice uh, for mature workers uh, looking to transit, right? And if, if, I, if the mature worker is uh, in the late 50s or 60s, yeah, what advice do you have for their transition? Uh, Sumadi? Okay, honestly, I have this thought in my mind when I'm, because I'm in my 40s. So I have this thought that I'm so old. Uh, how am I going to get a job? But let me tell you, this is just, it's just a thought. I, I cannot be thinking that I'm old, I cannot get a job. But what is the employer looking at me? Is it my experience? Is, is it my knowledge? Is my skill? What are they looking at me? So you have the kind of mindset that you can perform. It doesn't matter your age. As long as you can perform in your job, right? That, that, that's more important than anything else. Thank you, Smudi. Uh, Stephen? Um, as some of my favorite hip hop artists, Tupac Shakur said, age is just a number, right? And the oldest candidate that I have helped to place is 67 years old. Um, I, I get where you're coming from. And I think this is a question that many of my mid-career professionals have. Uh, we don't have the time to really dive in and for me to share with you the strategies. But in a nutshell, if I had to say this, right? Sometimes when I take the MRT in the morning, peak hour, you will see this 70-year-old Amma holding onto the metal railing, right? Looking like a cannon ready to go off her. Right, you'll see like some people in their 20s, right? They'll be like on a Monday, you know, first day of the work week, they'll be like slouched down <laughs> watching their K-drama. Like, ah. So I think it's not so much about the age here, but it's how, is, how are people going to perceive you as? And this is what we call your personal branding. And that is something that you can work on. All right, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Sumadhi. And uh, thank you, Tiban, for uh, joining us on our Career GPS. 
um, I, I'm sure our audience have benefited much from your uh, from both your sharing. Yeah. Um, and uh, thank you also North East CDC for uh, organizing uh, Career GPS. Yeah. Um, so with this, I think uh, right now I will hand my time back to Siddiq to share with everyone about some other resources that you can tap on uh, for your career transition. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> thank you, Nicholas, Stephen and Sumati. I am sure that there were many takeaways from the sharing that we can actually apply to stay relevant in this uh, disruptive economy. Uh, and so at this juncture, I, will, I would like to share some of the relevant resources from Skills Future, E2I, and Northeast CDC. Okay, so, so let's start with my Skills Future portal. So my Skills Future portal is a one-stop portal which contains various online resources to help all of us here in our career planning as well as skills upgrading. Okay, for example, uh, you can search for your desired courses. You can actually take a free career profiling test. You can discover related news and content with eBooks. Uh, and also you can find out about the latest industry, uh, industry trends. So let me elaborate a bit more on some of these resources. Okay, there are more than 20,000 courses and training on offer. So to help us in narrowing down the courses that are more relevant or one that interests us, you can either uh, first, browse by categories, and under this uh, browse by category tab, uh, there's further sub -break, uh, breakdown. Uh, for example, you can further browse under area of training, such as aerospace, uh, food and beverage, or you can even browse under training partners. If you have a training partner in mind, you can just zoom in straight to the training partners, key in their, their name, and then you can actually see all the list of courses under that particular training partner. Secondly, you can also search by keywords as highlighted on the screen right now. This is, these are the, the, the current programs that are available under SkillsFuture. If you know the program that you want to sign up for, you can search by keywords. And last but not least, you can actually click on the highlighted tabs. You know, so this again, uh, SkillsFuture, the portal, it has uh, a, des a designated tab that you can actually highlight, uh, that you can actually visit it by just clicking on the highlighted tab. All right? And speaking of courses, do you know that Singaporeans aged 40 years and above, that's basically me, can receive at least or up to 90% subsidy on cost fees. Uh, this only means one thing. That means more savings for us. And the best part is we can use that savings to equip ourselves with more skills and training. All right. I would also like to share a bit more on a full-time training program called the SG United Skills Program and the SG United Mid-Career Pathways Program. I would highly recommend for all of us here who are currently job hunting, or are considering to transit to a career in one of the emerging sectors to consider this program. So this particular program is very relevant for this particular workshop today. So the fees are $500 for six months and $1,000 for a 12 month program respectively. However, we can use our skills future credit to offset this cost fee. So that's a huge load off our shoulder, okay? Did I also mention that not only will you be receiving a monthly training allowance, you will also be able to obtain industry recognized certifications as WSQ full qualifications, post diploma, or even professional certificates from the IHLs once you've successfully completed the program. All right. Next, for those of us here who are looking at exploring a career in the emerging sector, or they call it the Sunrise Industries, you may like to search for courses under the Skill Future series. Okay, this is actually a curated set of short industry relevant courses focusing on the eight emerging areas of skills in Singapore, which includes, for example, digital media, finance, data analytics, and many more. Okay, these courses are, however, categorized into three proficient levels so that you will be able to find a course that suits your need as well, and more importantly, your proficiency level. Okay. And one of my favorite sections in this portal is definitely the resources section, which is simply a repository of articles, industry insights, and ebooks. But do you know that you can take a free career profiling assessment if you are to click on the assessment tab, which is pretty much going to be highlighted here. Extreme right uh, corner of uh, uh, what you see on the screen right now. There you go. All right. So this. Uh, assessment is called the RISEC Profiling Tool, okay? And its purpose is basically to understand uh, your personality, your strengths, and your work values to help you identify suitable career options. So at the end of the test, 
the tool will help you to discover which careers are most suitable for you according to your unique abilities, your career interests, your skills, as well as your work values. Interesting, right? And the best part is it's free. So please go try it, okay? So that's pretty much all the skills future sharing that I have for today. Now let's look at the job side of things. Okay, for those of us here who prefer a one-on-one -on -one career consultation, I, I can see that some of us are re asking that uh, in the chat group. Um, you can actually visit any of the four job hubs uh, on the Northeast CDC listed here for employment assistance. Okay, so basically there's one at Haugang, there's one at Bedok Reservoir Pungul, there's one at Kaki Bukit, and there's three under the project success. Okay, I'll leave this screen up for a bit more so that you can take a screenshot if you want to. All right, next. Alternatively, okay, uh, for those of you who prefer uh, to have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, discussion with an uh, E2I career coach, you can also do it by appointment only. So you, uh, but, but however, you must either call them at this number, uh, which is reflected on screen, or you have to make an e appointment at e2i.com.sg backslash appointment app backslash sfa dash n e. All right, again, I'll, I'll leave this screen up for a bit more so that you can have a screenshot and pre use uh, the QR code or, or, or the links uh, in a bit. Uh, okay, last uh, but not least, E2I also offers the Win the Job series that comprises of three workshops focusing on resume writing, interview skills, by the way, which Sumati actually attended, and negotiating your salary. In other words, these specialized workshops aim to provide you with the new perspectives at different stages of your job search. Uh, however, please note that each workshop is four hours long and uh, you need to register via the link, which is shown on screen here. Or alternative, again, you can actually whip up your phone and uh, scan the QR code uh, shown here. All right, again, I'll give you another probably half uh, a minute for you to do that. And so, ladies and gentlemen, there you go. Some of the relevant resources uh, for your perusal. And also with that, I've also reached the tail end of our workshop. Uh, finally, finally, okay, before we all go, uh, I appreciate if we can take three minutes of our time uh, to give us your feedback, okay? Uh, again, I will leave this screen up for the next minute or so. Uh, appreciate your honest feedback so that we can improve ourselves and give you a better uh, webinar series uh, in the next uh, uh, series of workshops that we are planning next year. You're welcome, Janice. You're welcome. And so with that, thank you once again for attending the GPS uh, workshop. Uh, like I said, this is the final one. It's been a pleasure seeing all of you over the last four sessions. We hope you have a great week ahead and I wish you all the best in your career journey. Looking forward to see you again. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen.